Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Let's Play Hearts Flying for the New Order. As I be here, let's continue on for last time off. So, we are, I mean, we're on the road to democracy. And I'm, I'm hoping that at least by the time this episode is over, we're at least in the middle of the elections, if not having already elected a, um, a, new, a new government for Iberia, you know, somebody to bring us into the future. And I mean, it, it seems like it's going okay. Right now, the biggest party is the market liberals, followed closely by the liberals. Are the social liberals, and then the um, conservatives are in, in a distant third place, and the left-wing parties basically don't have any chance whatsoever. Three military factories? We have one. Why not make another APC? That seems okay. Again, South Africa is still at war. The Union of South Africa is doing pretty decently. The Boer Republic, I, they're at war like so many different people that I can't imagine they're actually going to end up uh, succeeding in this. I mean, we have... Yeah, I mean, they're, the, they're about even, I think, because you have 15 divisions, you have 10 to 15, but you're also fighting on a bigger front. So I do think eventually the Boers will uh, lose. I'm not too sure it's going to happen with the Liberation Front and the Carnivan Defense League. No, not even a slight idea. Maybe they'll all reunify into one country. Who knows? I don't. So we have now... Um, We've, we've done the thing that worsens our stability, now we're going to do the thing that, it, that um, improves our stability. Or at least improves as much as we possibly can, given the, uh, the circumstances. It's like, I mean, like... I mean, there's also Lesotho, and then there's Swaziland. And I can't imagine they're really going to do too much. Because you're all, yeah, you're just all owned by Germany. Yeah, I think at this point, basically the, um, most countries, by the time, because we're in 1969, most countries are kind of reaching the end of, um, they're, re they're reaching the end of the focus streets. Like, most countries don't have too much information, not information, too much, um, too many, too many more steps after this point. Like, I, the fact that we're actually still going in 1969 surprises me a great deal. Um, like, I would imagine that probably, like, once we're done at the election, that's going to kind of be the end of it. Um, I don't know how much information there is actually in the election period and in the, the follow-up uh, governance. Closure. Unable to control his emotions, the inspector sat in front of the files in a house not even his own, and began to cry uncontrollably and bitterly. The case had taken everything from him, everything he had ever held dear, his wife, his home, his job, his friends, and even his pride. Now it was over. Before him lay the address, he attracted the missing pair too, a small flat in Barcelona, nothing befitting a wealthy heiress, but he was sure it was a happy home nonetheless. Picking out the receiver of the phone next to him, he briefly stalled. Many thoughts crossed his troubled mind as he carefully considered his next action. With grim determination, he carefully, however, oh no, with grim determination, he had finally entered the number he entered that he knew he needed to call. A cheery voice answered on the other end, informing the inspector that this is indeed speaking to the municipal police of Valoid, and then asked what it was he was calling about. I'm sure not to mention his name. Uh, the inspector gave the information that, that he had been working on years to obtain. All he could manage after the call was a long sigh. Not even an hour later, the phone rang again, uh, waking the inspector out of his daze with a jolt. He sat up when an unmistakably recognized the voice of his old sergeant. What surprised him was even more uh, than... Okay. What surprised him more, however, was what the man said back. We want you back. See, I'm a, I mean, he's a good detective. I really don't know the... Um, I mean, you've been doing this for, like, what, like, seven years at this point? It's a long time to try to track somebody down. Like, I feel like within seven years, you can probably knock on every single door in Barcelona and, um, see if it's the person you need to talk to. So, rotating in generals. Um, we're going to get more political power, gain a little bit more stability. Yeah, and, um, despotism has 0% support right now. I mean, we're still despotic, but, like, nobody actually... In a government actually wants that. Okay, it looks like the uh, the SS was defeated in South Africa. Not a major surprise. Because you're still also fighting against the Liberation Front. Like, are you... Like, I don't know who who are you. Got me loads of the Union Defense Force. Um, I really, I really don't know. I'm assuming they're gonna they're gonna join back with the um, the Union of South Africa if they end up winning the war, which I, I feel like they probably will. Like I don't think none of you guys in South America have a focus tree, as far as I'm aware. 
I mean, Paraguay has a lot of, um, national spirits. But that's different than, um, placeholder. Yeah, I'm gonna go and say that they're not, uh, ready for that. Okay, so next we will... Death's bottom goes down even more. I mean, it really doesn't matter which way we go for this. I mean, our stability is already... I think at maximum. I, I don't think it can get any better than this. West Siberian Republic's declared war on basically everybody. And Finland, apparently, as well. So you're going to try to fight everybody here. And then I'm imagining if you're going to fight these guys, then you two are going to fight amongst each other. And then after that's all done, whoever wins this front and whoever wins this front will eventually fight it out. I'm not too sure if maybe if um, Zukov wins here and you win on this side, whether or not you'll peacefully unify into like the Soviet Union or something like that, or if you'll go to war with each other. But I guess we shall find out. Like, how many troops do you have? Six, you know what? 62 divisions is, I think, more than enough to basically win all those fights. You have 19, you have 22. Yeah, no, so I think um, Boris Yeltsin here in the West Siberian Republic is definitely, definitely, definitely going to end up winning. I mean, he's got more troops than I think every other faction combined, and these guys are not going to help each other out. They're also at war with each other, right? So... I think we're going to see a democratic Russia. Maybe they'll also join the OFN. Because, like, you're in the OFN, right? Like, I do want to see if we can eventually join up with the Americans. You know, get... Have a powerful ally backing us, just in case the Germans get any funny ideas about what they want to do with us. Yeah, I'm sure Volga is going to be uh, killed fairly soon. I mean, again, you are fighting against um, Finland. How will that play out in the long run? I'm not too, too sure. Okay, let's tighten the window. Decision available. That's for... We can... Okay, you know what? Decrease you even more. How much black uh, market trading is there, is there even in the country right now? It's light. Central Siberia. Okay, so now you two are at war with each other. Not a major surprise. But who's going to win on in this front? 17 to 23 versus 13 to 18. I would lean towards the uh, the Soviets, but it's a little bit hard to say. And again, like, our, our army is basically not doing anything. Can I, like... Can I send you anything? I negotiate licenses. Start Lend-Lease. It's manually disabled, so I can't actually give you anything. But again, like, I would be surprised, I think it's also paused, I would be surprised if you lost. Like, like you're just in a much, much, much better position. Okay, Smarma's won their war, and then they'll immediately be killed right afterwards. Which is not a, not a huge surprise. Okay, the United States and Japanese are talking, I'm assuming this is about the, uh, yeah, about the ports here. I, I think this could... I might be wrong, but I think this has the potential to actually lead to a uh, nuclear war. Imagine how this campaign ends because Japan and the United States go to, like, war with each other. That'd be kind of, it'd be kind of funny, but also, like, kind of annoying. When I mean, you guys are very fascist right now. The D-Lie conspiracy. And, it, like, if the D-Lie conspiracy fires, you go, like, an ultra-nationalist, right? I believe so, and I'm pretty sure that ultra nationalists will probably not negotiate with the United States in any way, shape, or form. And a truly new state. Political party, popularity, we tracked in the decision screen. More stability. We are now a multi-party system. Registered voting. And the UN becomes the ruling party. Who is the UN? Authoritarian Democratic. Understandable enough. Again, I would I would imagine the um the market liberals are gonna win. At least based on this this um chart, but it could theoretically change in the future. And I think we're getting we're getting closer now that everybody here is going to be going to war with each other. Uh, we are we are getting closer to the oil crisis in the 1970s. Will that do anything against us? Maybe I don't know if it's programmed for Iberia to face the oil crisis at all. Okay. I mean, like, you're all going to die. Russia might, like, take back Karelia from, uh, from Finland. I'm not too, too sure.
I forgot that. I like how just Western Siberian, and Central Siberian, and the Far Eastern Soviet uh, socialist. I, I guess it's not called Siberia. I thought it was called Far Eastern Soviet Siberia or something like that, but. No, so we got two of them. Oman is now breaking out into civil war as well. Who's going to end up winning again? There's an insurrection. I think Saudi Arabia also starts to break apart. Dofa Rebellion. Yes, and they are the socialist. I think, like, Egypt also, I think, explodes. Iraq will. I don't remember if Iran also has a, um, a civil war or not. And a truly new state. We got a new flag. And I think we've also got a new color. But there we go. We are now the Iberian Federation. No longer the Iberian Union. I mean, are we still, um... We are still very, very stable. Everything's looking pretty good uh, right now for us. Preparing the Iberian election. The 30 years of dictatorship has made the prospect of free and fair elections purely theoretical up until now. Franco's re uh, relinquishment of power to the council has changed that, which means that Iberia has entered a crossroads in which way... Uh, the way in which we choose to organize the election uh, has been pushed to the forefront of political discourse. Whether it be the question of foreign observers or a possible extension of suffrage, the future Iberian democracy and the Union uh, Nationale's political hegemony lies now in the halls of the council's chambers with decisions... With decisions... Uh, which will shape the lives of Iberians for generations. From the conservatives to the reformists, lines are being drawn on the questions of what will uh, be the answer to set in the coming months. A liberal democracy, an authoritarian democracy, the urban rural the political divide. The answers to these questions will be decided in the fate of Iberia on both the de domestic and world stage for years to come. Yeah, so Franco is, I mean, he's still in charge, but he's no longer the, um... Are you the election? Okay, yes, we gotta do this first. So yeah, again, if we can finish this tree and get our way towards the election. Are these all these are all actually all five-day focuses? Actually, we'll be we'll be um I mean we're gonna get so many events that I don't actually know if we'll be able to do this in eight minutes or so. Cause I have I I'm recording this like literally I have like ten minutes until I have to go to class. Well that's okay. A lot we can allow you to work uh unionize. Yeah, you're not sure why not. You can unionize. Okay, so let's set up the election. Do not pause the game. The woman mayor of Bilbao. Okay, let's not worry about that. Pilar uh, Credit has organized her notes and adjusted her reading glasses. She has a very familiar face to the other Bilbao government officials, having served on the city council for five years. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bilbao City Council meeting of July 9th, 1969. Uh, hopefully this will be fast and efficient meeting. And I guess it's up to me to have a woman sitting here today Not only housing hosting today's conference, but sitting at the head of the local government This was truly unprecedented something not seen since before the Spanish Civil War by all means She was qualified as she was as qualified a woman as there was in the country and as passionate to advocate for national Catholicism as any woman could be perhaps that made a situation even more unusual to even think that a woman who fully believed that a woman's place in society was to be subservient to men would accept, much less ad actively seek out, such a high-ranking post. My has always wanted, has always been an ambitious woman. If she had not been, she would not have tried so hard to become an industry engineer, but no other woman had done the same. She certainly would not have conceded. Being married to one of Iberia's top diplomats didn't especially harm, didn't exactly harm her political career either. All that said, besides the novelty of having a woman in office, Karaga was not especially different from any other I Iberian mayor. The Gadilo's main goal in appointing her was neither out of the benevolent expansion of women's rights, nor, nor a cynical move to, to aside to... Aswaj? As as you know, to anyway, the rise of radicals outright outrage of women's lack of opportunities. Mayor Karaga had much more important issues to worry about, such as repairing the potholes that cratered the streets of Bilbao. Bilbao? Augusto Mandos Grandes is dead. Augusto Mandos Grandes was long regarded as one of the most fearsome men in all of Iberia. A brilliant tactician, a ruleless warrior, and a radical conservative sympathetic to the goals of Nazism. He led the Blue Division of Spanish Volunteers in the Second, Civil uh, Second World War and marched into Leningrad alongside here in the SS. In the aftermath of the war, rumors swirled that Hitler sought to overthrow Franco and Zalzir to make Mango Grandes his Papa Cadillo. Thankfully, Iberia remains free, and in the decades after the war, Mundus Grandes served faithfully as one of Iberia's top military commanders and political advisors. If Ryder had been alive in the land well into the 1960s, his health deteriorated rapidly in his, fi in his final months. 
He went to sleep in the evening of July 11th, and his heart stops shortly before midnight. Grandaz is a bona fide celebrity among the Iberian far right, the Flanage, and among Spanish nationalists, and they mourn his death with great reverence. But many other people are, truth be told, quite pleased to hear that the man is finally dead. They would not dare to say that in public, but the disdain Grandaz held towards reform, towards even a de uh, devote a deviation from his hardline conservatism, made him a symbol of everything wrong with the Iberian government in the eyes of liberals and reformists among the peninsula. In the city of Magdala, uh, some elderly residents recall that he led the army that slaughtered thousands of alleged Republicans, among them neighbors, friends, and family, in the bloodshed of February 1937. The death of Juan Grandes marks not just the end of one Iberia's most notorious leaders, but also serves as a reminder of the great age of many Iberians' top leadership. Salazar also died recently, and Francisco, uh, Francisco Franco is 76 years old. What will the Iberian government look like in 10 years, or 5, or even just 1 year from today? Okay, so we lost our field marshal. Apparently we had somebody who was sympathetic to, to the Nazis as being uh, the head military commander. So it means a good thing he didn't try to coup the government, we could have had some, uh, some problems. We're setting up our elections, we get a little bit of political power out of this. And what do we want to research? I mean, I guess we'll just keep on going for, um... We get Night Vision 3. I mean, it seems decent enough. Okay, so you guys have signed your, uh, treaty. The Observer Question. So we want four observers to monitor Iberian elections. So did you get... Yeah, you got San Francisco, you got Los Angeles. Did you get Hawaii too? No, you didn't. So it looks like they've kind of gone for the exact same thing we did. Oh, which is nice. At least they didn't kill each other. Okay, so I think you've won one of your wars. But again, you have 8 to 10 divisions against like 66. There's no way in hell you actually succeed. So I mean, you'll crush these guys. You'll probably crush Onega and maybe take territory from Finland. We'll have to kind of see. And after that, let's draw up electoral rolls. We should be getting an event soon, yes. The question of observers. With their newly granted powers, the reformists in the council are now in a position to truly reform Iberia into a democracy. However, this means that the way in which we structure the electoral system is still up in the air, and it's up to them to determine what the new Iberia should look like. The first issue that requires discussion is whether foreign governments should be allowed to monitor elections to ensure the, Democrat to ensure the elections are run fairly. While this would help legitimize whatever party wins and by extension our political system, there are worries amongst many of the more nationalist uh, leaning people that this would infringe on sovereignty of the nation and potentially give the countries we can observer status to a chance to influence the election. That being said, the hardline reformists demand that we allow total transparency in the upcoming election on the, as the peninsula hasn't seen a free election since the days of the Second Spanish Republic back in 1936. And they fear that authoritarianism could return without these international checks and balances. We could reach a compromise between the two by allowing observers but limited fashion in order to garner better reputation among the democracies of the world. You know what? We got nothing to hide. Give me 5% stability. Give me all the powers that we possibly can. I mean, I do I do like this flag. It's very bright. I, I mean, the colors are a little bit bright. But I think it's definitely a, uh, a slight improvement here. Draw up the electoral rolls. After that, let us do... I mean, might as well finish, like, this tree first and finish the other tree. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. Setting up suffrage list. The question of suffrage is perhaps the most important question in deciding the election. Who deserves the right to choose how they're governed and who doesn't is a very controversial issue among the council members, and three main proposals have been put forward for the council to vote on. The proposal put forward by the Conservatives details a plan which continues to exclude the people who couldn't vote in the under undemocratic elections back when the Cadillos reigned supreme. This is government a heavy fighter from the hardline reformists and surely would outrage the people disenfranchised by it. However, the Conservatives argue that allowing these people to vote would only lead to instability in our newly christened democracy. The radical reformists have declared that suffrage should be extended to everyone over 18. While they only hold a minority of the council, they seem to have popular support throughout the country. Judging by rallies that which have been held, visited by tens of thousands in order to pressure the government to open up the franchise. The final proposal is seen by a compromise option between the conservatives and the hardline reformists details universal suffrage with an ID registration system. This system could potentially dissuade some elements the conservatives want to ban while fulfilling the populist populist desire for universal suffrage. Okay, we'll expand suffrage uh, to everybody over 18. I mean, to me it seems like a... Uh... A reasonable thing. We'll probably see the finish before... I mean, you're done in five days. 
We'll we'll read this event and then I'll have to end this episode because again I have to go to class in like three minutes. Oh. Uh, also, we're almost running out of oil, so actually, before we read this event, uh, trade. I need to import like some oil. Probably just like two factories worth will probably be enough. You need to like, pop up the event. Okay, preparing the ballot boxes. Iberia has always been a sparsely populated area, with much of the electorate being located in rural areas. We're getting to the ballot, getting to the ballot box, considerably hotter than in our urban centers. This raises the question of how exactly we should distribute the ballot boxes to ensure that all voters can reach them and get their say in the election. Representatives from rural areas have asked for disappointingly more ballot boxes in urban areas because of the worry that there will not be enough to to make sure that people in these small communities can reach them on election day. My representatives from urban areas claim that this is unfair, that the current plan for distribution should uh, should suffice, and that rural representatives are trying to have their areas overrepresented. Over Regardless of what proposal plan we choose, we are making either urban or rural areas feel threatened under the representation, which could turn into apathy from the people who live in these regions. Okay, well, let's... We're, we'll do some basic stuff here, but I think again, like I gotta kind of end this episode like right now. So thanks everyone for watching my anthem. If you've enjoyed my thumbs up, not doing close thumbs down. If you want to see more subscribe and goodbye.